I, I suspect like many people in this room, I fell in love with the Beats at college. I can remember going to the campus bookstore and seeking out the Poetry Isle and the Ginsburg collections, um, which felt to me like a lifeline. I mean, I was an undergraduate, a closeted kid from New Jersey who wanted to be a creative writer. And I mean, Allen Ginsberg was, uh, made, meant the world to me. I mean, he was just such, his openness and his honesty just it felt to me like a transmission from the person I wanted to be. When you start to get into the beats, you, can only, you can't just do a little bit, and there are a lot of biographies out there. And this murder appears as a footnote in many of them. This murder was front page news in the New York Times in 1944. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing that, and knowing that these three amazing, most beloved writers of the 20th century were involved in this murder, it just seemed to me kind of the only mystery was why it hadn't been tackled before dramatically. So that's when I went to John, who is my college roommate, um, and uh, I suggested that, I told him I wanted to write it as a nonfiction book. And John, do you want to tell them about the Jedi mind trick that you pulled on my brain? <laughs> <laughs> that ended up with this. Austin came to me with the idea of doing this um, as a piece of potentially of fiction uh, 10 years ago. I had just finished film school and done a couple of shorts. And Austin was beginning to get some renown as a short story writer and a playwright. And as he's telling me the story that he wants to tell, I, of course, seeing, start seeing the movie in the back of my head. And I decided to convince him that I don't know if it would work as a short story, but as a movie, <laughs> right. it would be amazing. But what was really poignant about this is then I asked him if we could collaborate and work on it together. And you know, we've been friends since we were 18 years old, and we've shared you know, all of our work up until that point. Austin's actually the first short film I ever made on Super 8 before I really knew what I was doing. I showed it to Austin, and he said to me, John, it doesn't stink, and it's much better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but that was exactly the encouragement I needed at that time to keep going. Um, and in terms of do we do it as a crime drama, I mean, we, we knew we had an event. And we had this event, you know, the story that nobody really knew, but yet was the thing that caused Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and William Burroughs to stop talking about art and what they wanted to do to change the world as college students and to really put pen to page and become writers and start their revolution. We realized you know, the character with the greatest arc over the course of the story was Allen Ginsberg. Because he starts off at the top of the movie, a dutiful son who takes care of his emotionally ill mother, whose father is a struggling poet, and he knows he has a voice inside and he's scared he doesn't want to disappoint his father and say maybe I want to do this and do this in my own way. And then of course he meets this beautiful and charismatic young man who is somewhat also emotionally ill or troubled and again in a way becomes his caretaker. But by the end of the story, you know, it's a classic story, I think we've all been through this, of learning to take care of yourself and find your own voice. And that idea, a movie about someone, our favorite, you know, one of our favorite authors finding their own voice. Daniel, let me, let's follow up with that and, and uh, tell us what resonated for you when you read the script. I mean, you're, you're uh, from England. Um, yeah, and you're no. playing one of Amer you know, American literatures and poetry's American icons, mm. Allen Ginsberg. Yeah, I think one of the things that I love about it is just, and the thing that jumps out at, out at you about the script is the fact that it, the story is constantly being moved along, but it never becomes just expositional. It's always moved along through exchanges based on character and relationships, and that's always the mark of, I think, very good writing. Ginsberg's nationality, much like his sexuality or his religion, don't really weren't things that I particularly focused on or were in, intimidated by just because like I knew that he's American so I'll do I'll find the accent, I'll work on the accent and I'll, you know, get that and, and and but really the things that excited me about the character was that when you read his diaries as a teenager, he was just a really, he was unusual and interesting and, 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 uh, and a character, you know, worth putting on film, regardless of his later fame. You know, he was, he's interesting enough of his, uh, you know, standing alone at this point. And, you know, it's the, really, it's the split, and John, it's something John and I have talked about a lot, with a lot of creative people operate on this system, kind of veering between poles of anxiety and ambition. And, um, and uh, you know that's what Alan was as a teenager. He was both desperately insecure on some level, and then very shy socially, but also incredibly bright and had immense confidence in his uh, in his intellect. And I think the it's the sort of the gap between those two things is where really a really interesting character kind of lies, um, and, and and trying to you know reconcile those two things. John worked with me in a way that I've never been worked with before, um, and and put time in with me that, that you know, uh, due to the nature of the other jobs that I've done, there hasn't been necessarily time. Um, and, and, and John, for the year that I was doing How to Succeed, before we did 
uh, Keely Darlings. John and I would meet at least sort of once a month and start going through the script, going through the scenes, working while on the right, accent. While you were in, in? While I was doing How to Succeed, yeah. So we did this on the Sunday. Um, and then we'd um, just do like, yeah, we'd just go through, you know, work on accent, physicality, and, because that's the other thing about Alan, he, he wasn't athletic at all like Jack, but he had a really interesting physicality, and he was, if you, if you have the time or inclination to watch Pull My Daisy, the, ex uh, very, the art film they made, he's kind of goofy and fun, and, and he's actually, that's the other thing I, I liked about him, was that he was fun, like he, by all accounts, he was really good company, and, and, and I think you, you can <laughs> kind of like, well, he was, like, he was a laugh, he's, he was, you know, he sounds like he was kind of uh, funny and silly, and and um, I think it's very one of the things I love about the movie is the fact that it is fun. It's not just a sort of history lesson, you know. It it because I think if you make a film about the Beats who were having a great time and it's not fun, then you've sort of missed the mark, really. I think the script actually does a really good job of accurately capturing uh, who Lucian was as a person. Uh, but also, if you do go back and look at Ginsburg's diaries and the, the correspondence between Ginsburg and Kerouac and that kind of thing, you can start to uh, pull up stories uh, of things Lucian did that I think are really good keys into who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like standing on the dock of a ship and uh, sinking it just so we could feel what it was like to be on a sinking ship. <laughs> or um, like, you know, going to a restaurant and ordering the most expensive steak raw just so we could take it and throw it into the waiter's face. Um, like drinking wine at a bar and chewing off the glass and chewing the glass in his mouth just to like get a reaction from people around him. You know, like these kinds of things that actually you can find and are written if you dig. Um, I, you know, I think, are, are just more proof that in the script it's fairly accurately portrayed who he was at this point in his life. Mm -hmm. You know, originally when Austin and I were writing this script, we realized we had a murder story set in 1944, and I looked to see actually what had won Best Picture in 1944, and it was Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity. Laura, Gilda, it was a high point for American film noir. And I thought, well, why not incorporate the actual texture and structure of the films of the 40s within the film itself? So that's why we started the film off in the jail cell at this heightened point of tension, and then flash back to more innocent times to see how we got there and see if the characters can escape their fate or not. So I did heavily research into noir, noir styling, mm -hmm. but then I realized an academic recreation of a genre that already exists was kind of lifeless and didn't have the kind of youth and vitality that we wanted in this movie. And then while looking at color noirs and seeing where noirs went, of course, the French took their, put their hands on it and started the new wave. And I thought, there we go. Now there's an arc for the camera. And Sidney Lumet style, I'm very classical. I went to find kind of my spine of what I wanted the camera to be, as well as, you know, in every department, including the script. And the movie really is about going from places of conformity, like the university and row setting and row houses in Patterson, New Jersey, to nonconformity. And so as you can see, the movie starts off with very strict compositions with expressionistic lighting that are reminiscent of noir. And then as these two young men meet and we go down the rabbit hole with them, the camera all of a sudden comes off the tripod and becomes a lot more handheld and jazzier and free. And it was one of those cases where you look at the dailies after the first couple of days and you see the energy and the vitality that my actors are bringing and that Reed is bringing, the production designer is bringing, and you realize your child is starting to find its own voice. And I think the biggest lesson I learned was to step out of the way and kind of just let the, the voice of the movie start becoming who it had to be.